Israel's judicial reform foiled for now. The relentless pressure of protests has forced Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to delay his judicial reforms bill. But will that stop the tidal wave of protests across the country? Some demonstrators say they are determined to remain on the streets to end what they call a judicial coup once and for all. I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Israel. Well, the Israeli Prime Minister has halted plans for judicial reforms that prompted unprecedented protests nationwide. Netanyahu says to give time to real debate, he will delay the second and third votes on the remaining legislation until after the Passover holiday, ending April 13th. The move has put some at ease, saying it signals a willingness for dialogue. But the country's opposition and world leaders are now closely watching Netanyahu's next move. A legislation proposal that has set Benjamin Netanyahu on a collision course with the people. Just weeks after being reinstated as Israel's Prime Minister, his government announced plans to introduce new laws to reform the country's judiciary. The constitutional revolution and the increasing interference of the judicial system in the decisions of the government and in the legislation of the Knesset have degraded trust in the judicial system to a dangerous low, led to the loss of governance and damaged democracy. The proposed law would limit the powers of the Supreme Court, halting its ability to rule against the legislature and the executive. It would also remove the court's power to review the legality of Israel's basic laws, which function as the country's constitution. Some demonstrators who have protested weekly since January 7th believe there's a direct link between the proposal and the corruption charges Netanyahu is facing. Others are concerned the proposed changes will give too much power to the Knesset, Israel's parliament. Right now what drives me is my daughter, my nine-year-old daughter, that I want her to grow up in this country. I want her to have every possibility she dreams of. And that won't happen if this uh, judiciary overhaul will take place. Some in Netanyahu's own government have raised concerns. In recent days and weeks, during conversations and discussions behind the scenes, I presented the security situation to various parties. I asked, reasoned, and said that at this time, the process must be stopped so that we may sit and talk. These comments led to Gallant's sacking, suggesting Netanyahu would dig in his heels. But on March 27th, he announced a compromise. Out of a sense of national responsibility, out of a will to prevent a rupture among our people, I have decided to pause the second and third readings of the bill in this session of the Knesset in order to give time and reach to that wide consensus. Israel's opposition party is cautiously optimistic. We need to let the president determine a mechanism for the dialogue and trust him to be a fair mediator. This is what we have demanded for the past months, genuine and constructive dialogue by a leadership willing to take responsibility. The move has not stopped the protest, but has given hope to some Israelis. I'm happy he's getting back to the negotiating table. I think that there are certain things that are great about the reform. I think there are certain things that are not great about the reform, and I think it still needs to be developed a bit more before it's passed. It has also been welcomed by U.S. President Joe Biden, who has suggested that Netanyahu should go further than just pausing the legislation. I hope the Prime Minister will do on that particular law. I hope he, uh, I hope he walks away from it. These comments have not been taken lightly by Netanyahu, prompting him to tweet, Israel is a sovereign country which makes its decisions by the will of its people, not based on pressures from abroad, including from the best of friends. Netanyahu has not yet set a deadline for the talks, 
But Israel's Passover holidays from the 5th to the 7th of April are expected to be a period of reflection for those in favor and against the law. What is clear is that Israelis have drawn a line in the sand and are urging Netanyahu's government not to cross it. So, delayed but not forgotten. Where will Israel's judicial reform go from here? Well, joining me now to debate that and more are, from Tel Aviv, Peter Lerner. He is the Director General of Hisadrut Global, the International Division of Israel's General Federation of Labor. From West Jerusalem is Mitchell Barak. He served as an aide to Benjamin Netanyahu and was a speechwriter for former Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. And also in West Jerusalem is Jeremy Sultan, former Knesset Faction Director of the Yamina Party. Thanks all so much for being with us. Uh, Peter, let me start with you. This isn't necessarily a victory for protesters because it is just a delay. So what are the chances you think these reforms will either be dropped or be renegotiated to take a form that a majority of Israelis can live with? So what we're seeing now is actually a hiatus which appears to be sensible. And that is basically what the history of what the General Federation of Trade Unions requested. We demanded a halt, a pause that would get people to the table. And that's what we've been asking for the last 12, almost 13 weeks now. Uh, so we're happy with the result. Uh, will it lead to the change that uh, so many people in Israel are demanding? I don't know. But this is, I think, the first time I, we can actually be optimistic that the people that were feeling unheard now have a seat at the table. Okay, so Jeremy, just describe the change you want to see. What would be acceptable? Well, first of all, I, I have to echo what Peter is saying. The fact that uh, both sides are actually sitting together and talking is really a refreshing change and something that I think really most Israelis from both sides of this um, argument on the legal reform feel to be very happy about. I think the type of reform that would be one that would be good for both sides would be one that would be able to create checks and balances on one side, but also on the other side, be able to provide a change to the current system and make sure that within Israeli law, we go ahead and we uh, really deal with some of the things that are still lingering questions in terms of chapters of our uh, basic laws that have not been written yet, such as uh, basic law legislation. And of course, uh, as I mentioned before, the checks and balances between the three branches of government. So hopefully we'll see some president's residence. OK, Peter, let me come back to you then quickly and ask if you think that's acceptable, uh, what you're hearing from, from someone on the right. Um, would that work enough to keep the labor unions and the other hundreds of thousands of Israelis off the streets? So the, the General Federation of Labor in Israel, Histadrut, represents workers from all political parties. And Histadrut hasn't put forward a position specifically regarding um, the judicial reform or, or um, upheaval, as, as it's being called, uh, precisely because we represent everybody. Our governing body is made up of all of the political spectrum. So what we need to do is make sure that these the talks can continue and provide what politics is supposed to provide, a negotiated agreement between all sides, which all sides can live with. Um, will the, the, the situation, as far as we're concerned, workers' rights need to preserve, be preserved? Our role in this as a, as a federation of workers is to make sure that those workers' rights can be preserved. But there are, of course, many other concerns that we're seeing. So many people come out to the streets talking about and, uh, and feeling frustrated about the proposed changes. And I think that the, the whole notion and how things have unraveled over the last three months is a way of a winner takes all. We won the election, mm. therefore we can oh. do whatever we want without really taking you into consideration. And I think that was the biggest frustration of everybody, and that's why so many people came out. Okay. Mitchell, uh, let me ask you then. We, you know, we're, we're hearing what, a rather broad, I, I'm going to say, a rather broad description of, of what could be negotiated and how this could actually work for everybody. Uh, the details are going to be the problem. Um, do you think, particularly, we've heard from the workers' perspective and why, why they are on the street, but what about the judicial reforms issues? Because that is really well, where the, the massive 
contrast is. Well, I, I think uh, Peter hit it pretty good when he said, uh, you know, we, it's, a, it's a winner take all election. We won. You lost too bad. Uh, that's not how it works. And that's certainly not how it works with the judiciary, which is supposed to protect minorities. And, you know, it's ironic that many of the parties that are supporting this judicial reform actually want the theocracy in the country. They, you know, Israel, I like to joke, is really one of the few democratically elected theocracies in the world. So they want, you know, Torah law or religious law. A lot of the, the parties don't have a respect even, less, let's say, for civil law. They think that the Torah law, Jewish law, trumps or is more important to them than civil law. And they're talking about judicial reform. So that bothers a lot of people, the fact that, um, you know, that, that it's not being done with a consensus, that for months and months they avoided it. Uh, the coalition parties avoided talking about it. They basically rammed through uh, this legislation through committee. And at the same time, we're passing other things that were relevant and also seen as corrupt, like that a minister who was already, you know, indicted and couldn't, you know, the Supreme Court said he couldn't, you know, serve again. And he also made a plea agreement, Arya Derry, which said he wouldn't serve. Let's get him back in. Now let's pass something that says a court can't, um, you know, uh, uh, take a prime minister. A prime minister can't be uh, taken out of office because of either, you know, health reasons or because mm -hmm. of conflict of interest. Only the cabinet, two thirds of the cabinet that he selects can do that. Now they went and tried to pass the uh, presence law. So any civil servant could receive, you know, benefits or help in a, in a legal case against him. It's just one thing after another. Okay, then how far do you think Netanyahu will go? I mean, there is a lot at stake for him here. He cobbled together this coalition after, you know, losing the election prior. Um, add that to staying in power now and especially reforming the judiciary the way he's proposed in a way that would keep him out of prison. So how how hard is he going to fight he, to get the he, more extreme will, elements of the judicial reform? The end. I, I, you know, I've said this before. He has this Samson principle. If I can't do it, I'm going to bring down the whole house on top of me and I'm going to destroy everything. And we've seen the damage this government has done in three months in office. The shekel mm. has crashed. The economy is crashing. Foreign investments are gone. Relations with the diaspora, all time low. The U.S. president comes out and says the prime minister is not invited to the White House. I mean, how bad could it be? It's pretty bad. And he's done all of that. Jeremy. In addition, in, in yeah. addition, he's also, you know, again, I don't know enough about the judicial reform, honestly, but I know every smart person that I respect in Israel, all the former heads of the Mossad, the Shin Bet secret police, the former attorney generals, former generals, all the major law firms have all come out against this. So I'm not that smart, but I know the really, really smart people are really against this. And there's very few people that I've seen that have come out and say, yeah, a lot of people agree there should be reform, but not this. But the, okay. the last thing I want to say about Netanyahu is he talks about, yeah, let's having a compromise, but he brilliantly now waited all this time, let the country burn, now talks about compromise, but still has the legislation on the table mm -hmm. that could be that could be voted in any minute. And what does he do? He now race baits the other side. All of his supporters, he say, you're really second class citizens. It's the elite of the country, which is a code word for the Ashkenazi, those uh, Jews of Western descent that are in, you know, these really crackerjack units and, and pilots and programmers. And you're the guys that are the soldiers and your vote is not as good because wow. they created an anarchy, they demonstrated, and now we have to do it. So he's got all these people. He already has his campaign lined up for the next time. Mitchell, okay. Which is, you're not second-class citizens. That is a fascinating psychoanalysis of, of a man that you used to work as an aide for. So, Jeremy, I mean, considering that, sure. this is someone that's well, worked Well, I, I just want to say, for the record, that was 30 years ago. Fair enough. The man has not changed. But you did work close, right. So, so this is from someone who has known him rather closely in the past. Correct. I mean, Jeremy, having heard that, uh, from Mitchell, would you agree that Netanyahu has the potential to just kind of burn the house down with him, that maybe these reforms are being delayed right now, but he still has every intention to force them through? I, uh, I tend to believe that all people that work or are actors within the political arena are uh, rational actors and therefore uh, attempts to try to uh, view them as something other than that are not just not productive, but they're just not helpful to be able to actually analyze and explain a situation. I think uh, there are many reasons of uh, whatever outcome that we 
uh, are going to have from the president's residence in terms of things don't go well, in terms of uh, going ahead and spreading the blame. Obviously, the prime minister being at the head of the government will be the one who sees a majority of that in terms of uh, the blame being uh, sent uh, to his um, footstep. But I'd like to hope that we see a situation where the majority of uh, people see a, a consensus out of what comes out of the president's residence. And I'm saying that not just on the political arena, but I think also in terms of most Israelis today, that is what they want to see. There is a reason why we went from a position of hundreds of thousands of people on the street to a situation where there is now barely anyone in the street. Both sides are giving this process a chance. And I think that it's unfortunate there are extremists on both ends that are trying to bring us back to the street. Let's let people try to work things out behind closed doors because the open process of the Constitution Committee, frankly, did not get us anywhere. Let me go back to Peter then and, and just ask, I mean, if, if that, how it makes you feel to hear at least someone say that, okay, now going forward, uh, we can you know, work together versus Mitchell's assessment that says, you know, Netanyahu is totally capable of, of burning the whole system uh, so that he doesn't fall alone. Do you have an opinion on that? So I would say that what we saw actually in this debate, it was very similar to what we saw on uh, Monday, where so many people came together with a joint uh, effort to try and find a solution. Will we find that solution? And what will the solution be? We don't know. But we need to make sure that we don't burn the house down. And I would say that, you know, the threat of strike again can be on the table. And that's something that needs to be, I'm sure Prime Minister Netanyahu is aware of. I think we made it very clear on Monday that the state of, you know, disarray and disgust and um, hostility between two sides of the same people is unacceptable. And therefore, we put our foot down and rallied the entire society mm. and entire, entire economy to a standstill, which was very effective. At the end of the day, Netanyahu indeed called it off. He said, let's shelf it for the moment. We'll do the negotiations and we'll try and get a joint result. Um, you know, there is so much distrust. And this, when we see more people still continuing to protest, and I expect that, that uh, Saturday night, we will still see people coming out to protest. And I think it's important that these protests do continue because there is still concern that Netanyahu will not fulfill his commitment to allow a real negotiations, a real uh, mutually agreed outcome. And I think that is what we really need to hope for. So okay. protests okay. aside, demonstrations aside, negotiations aside, if all else fails, we can strike. You can strike and perhaps, I don't know, Peter, do you think you might see another election? Oh, wow. I think Netanyahu will do everything in his power to avoid that. Um, if you've looked at the polls mm -hmm. just coming out this week, mm -hmm. it's the worst he's had, I think, probably for the last 10 years. Um, so I don't think elections would be in his best interest, although there are many people in Israel that would probably say it's in our best interest from the, from the center left as they see that their power is going up. There is a lot of frustration with Netanyahu and how he's managed this crisis, this internal crisis, unlike anything we've seen before. So. When we look at that, we need to keep in mind that there is, you know, this political unknown that um, Netanyahu will want to avoid in 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 every essence. Mm. Um, you know, it took him so long on Monday to come out to the public, and because he was precisely negotiating with the radical right wing parties in his coalition, so he's trying to keep okay. the the uh, the forces together in that respect in order to try and continue. Um, I don't know. We'll yeah. see. That could be the sixth election in uh, four years if uh, if they get it uh, if they get it right <laughs> or, or not right. Yes. Uh, Mitchell, let me come back to you though because I, 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 we have to raise this. I mean, in all of this, we're seeing this grand display of Israeli democracy and the power of the people hitting the streets. Still, nothing has been mentioned about the plight of the Palestinians in all this. And this is the quintessential struggle of, of Israel. And it's, it's interesting to see the, the freedom Israelis have to protest contrasted with the, the lack of rights of Palestinians. Will any of that be raised going forward? I mean, which is, are you talking about Israeli Arabs or Palestinians? Uh, in, both, in the... both. 
Well, uh, so, so Israeli Arabs get, are part of the process, meaning they were part of the last government. They, they hardly voted in the last government. election. They've, they've, they decided they've all but given up. Do, why, why they decided not to be so vocal in this, I don't know, because a lot of the, the concern was is that minorities wouldn't be protected. But it's only surprising to those people from abroad, journalists and other people that have made the Palestinian issue the focus of everything that they do. And, you know, it's at the core issue of, you know, Israeli society. It is important. And I think that the attitudes are changing there. But, you know, at least three quarters of the parties or more, 80 percent of the Knesset agrees on the policies of the Israeli government, whether they, you know, agree with expanded mm. settlements or existing settlements or settlement blocks. There's only really one party, Meretz, that was talking about, you know, uh, the West Bank and uh, as, a, as a military, uh, you know, as a military zone. And they're not in the Knesset anymore. The Labor Party, Yeshatid. Benny Gantz's party, and everything to the right, all the religious parties. That includes most of the Knesset, with the exception of the Arab parties. So it's really not the issue to be talking about. Mm. But, uh, you know... I'm not sure it's, Arab it's, Israelis or Palestinians... We, unfortunately, I don't have, we don't have an Arab Israeli or a Palestinian on the panel today. But uh, if I can just, if I can just uh, you know, qualify one thing I said. I never called the, the prime minister an irrational actor, Jeremy. But Thomas Friedman of the New York Times did. So, you know, there are people around the world that are calling him a little bit irrational. Uh, yeah. I'm not one of them, but certainly his sure policy of watching the either. army, you know, disintegrate and the shekel disintegrate and foreign investment disintegrate, he does seem to have that Samson syndrome of, with his, uh, with his wife Delilah, you know, being played by Sarah Netanyahu, let's burn down the house, let's take it all down. If we can't rule this Knesset, okay. no one else will. Jeremy, I know you disagree there, but I, I need to ask you about something else. We've, we're down to our last four minutes. You know, uh, you know what happened recently as well uh, in relation to the United States. Netanyahu was, was very displeased, to say the least, uh, after President Joe Biden said that he hoped the reforms would be dropped altogether. Uh, that was a pretty significant moment. Do you think at this point Netanyahu can afford to be at odds with, you know, the only true ally that has protected Israel at all costs, uh, even if it means defying UN resolutions, can he afford to strain that friendship? Uh, the special relationship between Israel and the United States is at the heart of Israel's national security interest. That is obvious to, to everybody, whether it's coalition or opposition or anyone that has sat on the seat of uh, prime minister. Of course, uh, during Israel, uh, Israel's time since uh, our establishment in uh, the modern state, we've had a number of times where things were not uh, necessarily uh, uh, so bright or peachy, and many times things have gone out into the uh, air, and uh, obviously uh, that's the type of conversation you can have out in the open when you are friends. I would like to see measures that would fit into be the repair uh, what we saw there in terms of uh, uh, what happened over the last week, uh, based on various things that I read within the news, it seems that there seems to be uh, a number of uh, issues of miscommunication between uh, the leaders and the leadership uh, between Israel and the United States. Hopefully those things are corrected. But like I said, it's very important that Israel are on the same page. There's no question mm. about that. Uh, Jeremy, I, I see you shake, uh, nodding your head in agreement, but I mean, do you think the United States, especially in this case, uh, has the right to speak up here? And you, and as, and as, a, as an Israeli, as a protester, you know, yourself, do you want to hear from those abroad on these issues facing Israel right now? I think you were talking to me. Yeah? Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, Peter. Was... Yes, go ahead. Um, I would say that... Uh, um... We have a very strong friend in the US, and we need to be very cautious about abusing that friendship. We need to listen to our friends because that's what friends do. Um, we don't need to be at odds. And I'm, you know, I'm grateful for the fact that our friends can tell us, and we have to listen, uh, what they think about, how they see the situation, and they are concerned. You know, uh, President Biden has sent a very clear message. Um, it's a message that most Israelis are quite shocked of hearing. Uh, they don't want that type of relationship with America. We want a relationship that is open, supporting because of the shared values. And when America is saying, listen to this story of shared values, if you're changing your values, then you have to be wary.
So I think it's a okay. it's a good thing that they okay. sound, make this sound that President Biden is sending a clear message. I think Prime Minister Netanyahu would do his best to recalculate his steps and make sure that you know what what is dem democracy at the end? What are we talking about? Mm. People want to be heard. They want to have a say, not just every time that there is an election, but when something substantial is happening, right. like a, a huge judicial reform. Then, if there is so much unrest, then how do you listen to the people okay. that are a concern? And how do you mitigate those concerns? Mitchell, and that is the that is the that's what President Biden is saying, basically. Mitchell, twenty seconds. It's great when the United States says something. Biden, unlike any other president in the last fifty years, has has foreign policy experience. For forty years, he has been by Israel's side in everything. And you know what? I remember. Prime Minister Netanyahu went to Congress to lobby against something that united an internal issue in order to gain some political pull before an election. That was seen terribly, even many years later, going to Congress and, you know, okay. kind of lobbying against Obama and Biden. He's got a, a serious a history of doing that. Mitchell, I'm going to have to leave it like there. Uh, unfortunately, we're completely out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank our panelists so much for being with us, our audience as well for watching. Remember, you can follow us on uh, Twitter, and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.